It is a cool summer morning on the slopes of the Apennine Mountains. On the shores of the river Tiber, the bustling town of Tifernum awoke to the noise of the carpenter and his apprentices, as they started work on a wealthy trader's veranda, bright and early. The local dressmaker hurried down the main street to her customer, used to hearing the usual cat calling by the baker and fishmonger. As the other tradesmen opened their shops, just outside the town, a Roman army was marching by, commanded by Fabius Maximus. Heading south towards Samnium, they advanced towards the narrow valley, just south of Tifernum. There, hidden in the hillside forest, an army of 25,000 Samnites had set a trap. But before we continue, I want to shout out today's sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is a project based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lairds, lords and ladies. What Established Titles does is give you one square foot of land so you can call yourself a lord or a lady and provides you with an official certificate with a crest. Once you have your certificate, you'll have a unique plot number to see the exact location of your land. And by owning this land, Established Titles allows you to change your name to Lord or Lady on credit cards, plane tickets, or even dating profiles, and much, much more. Through doing this, Established Titles plants a tree with every order and works with global charities, One Tree Planted, and Trees for the Future to support reforestation efforts. And Established Titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot, just a few minutes walk between each other. And depending on how many of you want to become a lord or lady, we can build our own little history marsh kingdom. It makes an amazing last minute gift and Established Titles is actually running a massive sale. Plus, if you use the code MARSH10, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash MARSH10 to get your gifts now and help support the channel. Despite emerging victorious after two grueling wars, Rome's dominance over central Italy was not yet established. Etruria was not yet pacified, and a hostile Umbria could strike from the north. To the south, the Samnites held their own on the battlefield against the Romans and were far from being truly cowed. Equally warlike as the Romans, the Samnites continued to pursue imperialistic ambitions on the Italian peninsula. However, they now faced a rejuvenated Rome. Having learned from their humbling in the Battle of Cordine Forks, the Romans spent years replacing their unwieldy phalanx by adopting the Samnite Manipula Formation. Furthermore, the recently built Appian Way provided logistical support and the ability to quickly respond at crisis points. The seeds were sown for a third and final war. In 299, a coalition of raiders from Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul invaded Etruria and were paid off by the Etruscans. The Romans used this as an opportunity to accuse the Etruscans of seeking to ally with the Gauls against Rome, and had in turn allied themselves with the Picentis. Consul Valerius, pretext in hand, moved into Etruria, destroying villages in an unsuccessful attempt to provoke the Etruscans into battle. Then, from the south, Lucanian envoys came seeking help from Rome. The Samnites attempted to form an alliance with them, but once negotiations broke down, Samnite armies marched into Lucania, inflicting several defeats and taking multiple towns. The Romans agreed to aid in the war, less so out of compassion for Lucania, and more out of fear of growing Samnite strength. The Romans committed to fighting a two-front war against the Samnites and Etruscans. However, the opening campaigns produced mixed results. Consul Scipio Barbatus, the great-grandfather of Scipio Africanus, fought a costly, indecisive battle near Volaterrae. 
but the Etruscans retreated, leaving the Feliscan district and the territories north of the Tiber open to Roman raids. Scipio's consular colleague, Fulvius Maximus Centumulus, was more successful, advancing into Samnium and achieving victory near Bovianum. He then captured both this city and Alfidena. It is possible that the Samnite forces in the vicinity were insufficient to hold off a full-scale invasion, having not expected the Romans to attack so soon, given their war with Etruria was ongoing. The Roman consular elections for 297 were the first elections to be held following the outbreak of war with the Samnites. Amidst rumors that the Etruscans and Samnites were raising huge armies, fittingly, the voting centuries unanimously chose Fabius Maximus Rullianus. He had been the most successful general of the Second Samnite War, winning as many as 16 battles against the Samnites, the Etruscans, Umbrians and Apulians. This was the original Fabius to win the cognomen Maximus. He was the great-grandfather of the Delea, who would later fight Hannibal. Fabius, however, who was not a candidate for election, refused the proposal. He then relented on the condition that Decius Mus, another veteran of the Samnite Wars, who had been consul with Fabius in 308 BC, be elected as his colleague. Still early in 297, envoys came from several southern Etrurian cities with news that they wished to discuss peace. This meant that both Roman consuls could now turn their attention south. The Samnites learned of this and dispatched an army to protect their northern flank. Meanwhile, Fabius was on his way from Rome to take command of the army in Etruria and relieve Scipio, while Decius assumed command in Samnium instead of Fulvius. And he arrived just in time, for another army from Apulia was on its way to reinforce Samnium proper. But Decius intercepted and routed them at Maleventum, with 2,000 Apulians dead and many more captured. Meanwhile, Fabius was now ready and moving south with an army of 20,000 troops. As the 20,000-strong Roman army marched in a loose formation, it appeared they were unaware that a trap was set just south of the town of Tifernum. An army of 25,000 Samnites lay in wait, hidden in the thick hillside forest ready to ambush the Romans as they passed through the narrow valley. But Fabius made sure to send advanced scout parties and had already detected the ambush. And now he planned a trap of his own. Several hours ago he sent Scipio with a Hastati detachment on a flanking maneuver, tasking him with finding a way to the rear of the enemy. Meanwhile, Fabius pretended to be conducting a forced march, as if unaware of the ambush, making the Samnites believe that their plan was working. In doing so, he kept the Samnites strewn about the forest and out of formation, as the Romans gradually closed the distance. Once at Tifernum, the consul suddenly halted the column. He ordered the troops to form that square formation. The Samnite leadership that was closest to the Romans could see what was taking place and had only then realized that they had lost the element of surprise. But their troops further south along the hillside could not see what was taking place at the entrance into the valley and had no way of knowing that the plan failed. It was too late to reform the line. Then. At the head of the Roman column, Fabius led the square into the narrow valley. The Samnites, meanwhile, passed the word that the Romans prepared to give battle and ordered the troops to stand by. Knowing that there is no reason to keep hiding, Samnite officers hastily formed their men into battle lines along the hillside. As they moved down the road in formation, Roman troops could only catch glimpses of enemy soldiers amongst the trees, 
and had no way of knowing that the Samnites, in fact, outnumbered them. As Fabius's column crept ever further, suddenly horns sounded off from either side of the narrow valley. An endless swell of battle cries reverberated as the Samnites advanced down the slopes to meet the Romans. Attacking from higher ground, the Samnites quickly took the initiative. Fabius had perhaps underestimated the numerical strength of the enemy, and now his legions were trapped. His square warded off attack after attack, but were slowly being squeezed inwards and forced out of shape. The Samnites were clearly getting the upper hand. Fabius pulled the Hastati from the line and reinforced them with his Principes. He ordered them to break through the front of the enemy. The Romans gained some ground, but the Samnites put up a fierce resistance, eventually beating back Fabius's strike group. But then, from the rear appeared Scipio at the head of the Roman Hastati. Seeing the charging infantry, the troops from both sides mistakenly thought that this detachment heralded the arrival of the army of the other consul, Decius Mus, who was actually stationed several hundred kilometers to the south in Samnium. Nevertheless, the Roman morale soared while that of the Samnites collapsed. Before Scipio could make contact, the Samnites lost their nerve and fled into the hills. Having been pressed from all sides, the badly shaken Romans were in no shape to pursue. So, with fairly low casualties, the Samnite army lived to fight another day. Following the encounter at Tifernum, Fabius continued his advance south unhindered. Meanwhile, Decius had camped at Maleventum, where he had previously defeated an Apulian army meant to reinforce the Samnites. The two consuls spent the next five months devastating Samnium and capturing several towns. However, no triumphs are recorded in the year 297 BC, so it is unlikely that they made any deep inroads into Samnium during this year. The Samnite army was on the back foot, but their numbers were preserved. They were already regrouping to continue the war. Embassies were sent to Etruria, seeking an alliance. The Romans had the upper hand, for now. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.